Hello everyone. Uh, so we are live again uh, for another author live chat with science series and today Tuesday um, 7th of September 8 p.m. PST. Uh, Tuesday your next page turner we have another fantastic author joining us today and uh, he is author Patricio and uh, we're going to talk about his latest book uh, and interestingly, you know, we will talk about globalization and uh, what what's really um, interesting is that, you know, we are all stuck in this pandemic and we are not able to connect with people as much as we could in the past, like, you know, in the, in the past um, two years ago. So talking about globalization, talking about how we are all still, you know, able to connect with people outside uh, where we live. It's going to be something really interesting, and um, uh, among that, we will also touch on a few other aspects like uh, immigration, terrorism, and things like that, which are featured in his book. So let me just briefly explain to you a little bit about uh, Patricio, uh, his introduction. Patricio was born in Quito, Ecuador, and moved to California at the age of 12. He writes in English and Spanish. His first book, Walking Around with Antje and Bukowski, is made up of 21 essays grouped into sections about art, politics, and autobiography. His second book, 80 MPH, is a collection of 80 powerful poems written in Spanish. His first novel, Reggaeton Cruz, has been called a techno beat, The Great Gatsby. Some of the novel's themes are globalization, viral fame, and hyperreality. The narrative plot is complex in the characters from all over the world. Through the novel, though the novel touches upon immigration, terrorism, exile, and murder, parts of it are humorous, while others have been called thought provoking and even unnerving. So, too Much Sweetie is his second novel, is about Rene, a young Ecuadorian artist trapped between a moneyed upbringing and his current down and out North American reality. Rene's tense world, worldview all but collapses when he falls for uh, Meow Meow, an ambitious Tahir Masu who loves him for all that he wants to leave behind. Too much sweetie that strangers of things, a sensual novel of ideas is set to be published later this year under the Hollywood publisher Grady Miller Books, which has also published the writer's previous books. Along Miller, Maya has gathered the collected poems of Aldo Tambellini for publication. He has also acted as editor in chief of AT MPH anthology, which showcases the work of various Hispanic and American writers. Uh, Maya holds an MA in arts journalism from the Newhouse School at um, Cyrus University and BA in English from uh, CSULA. He has been a visiting scholar at the Carl Arts Aesthetics and Politics Program and a poetry lecturer at the Los Angeles Public Library Summer Lecture Series. So without further ado, let's welcome author uh, Patricio to the show. Hello, hello Patricio. Hi Jasvina, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Great, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us today to talk about your uh, writing journey. And I think, uh, you know, we're going to touch about um, a lot of interesting aspects about your book as well. And, you know, uh, the things that you have written and your um, journey as a writer as a whole, right? So uh, before we talk about that, Patricio, um, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit to the um, audience? Sure. Well, you know, you did a, a wonderful job introducing me. And it's always so interesting when you get introduced because it's all of your, your accomplishments sort of thrown in right next to each other, you know? So it feels like so much more because it's been years in the making, right? 
But when people are introducing you, they're right next to each other. So it's like, you know, he wrote this book and then he wrote this book. It feels like you wrote the book like the next day. You know what I mean? So it's it's been a it's been a long time uh, in in it happening, making it happen. Um, pretty much what you said, you know, I'm Ecuadorian American. Uh, I've written a few books, one in Spanish, a book of poems, uh, 80 miles per hour. Then I have the uh, essay collection called Walking Around Fante Bukowski, which was my first book. And then I have the third book, which is, has just been published uh, a couple months ago. Well, to me, that's just been published because it takes a long time to gather the momentum. So those those three books, and then I have the other one, the fourth one, that's still being edited, and that should come out next year. So it's been a very active few years for me after graduating from Syracuse University, where I got my MA. Uh, and it took me a few years to get it together and to get my store, my voice together. And now I feel like once I found it, it start, it all started coming out creatively. Uh, and essentially, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I teach community college. I teach English and Spanish at the community college level. I do a little art criticism here and there. But mostly, I'm a working writer. That's how I define myself. A working artist, really, because I do other things. But but right now, the emphasis is fiction, in particular, Reggaeton Cruise, which is the novel that I wrote during the pandemic. We're still in the pandemic, unfortunately. But I wrote during the worst of it, the worst, the, the worst part of the pandemic. Six months, seven, seven months. Every day, you know, I would work three, four hours. Uh, and I almost didn't realize that the whole world was sort of collapsing around me, you know, because you're so into the project um, that that you don't realize that, that what's happening. And so when I finished the first draft. I looked down and I saw like, oh my God, what's happening? So, you know, but during, but as way of introduction, I want to say that I'm a very, I'm a working writer. That's what I am. Mm -hmm. uh, Patricia, I think uh, you, you did a wonderful job in uh, introducing yourself and like, you know, how you define yourself. And I think that that's really interesting. And um, I noticed that you mentioned that um, you're teaching and you know, you um, you do this. Um, uh, this is sadly something that you have been doing during the pandemic, right? So um, tell us a little bit about your interest in writing and how long has, uh, has it been like, you know, have you been writing? Um, actively, uh, is this something that you discovered um, lately, or have you been always writing, and this is just something that you know? Yeah, I, I started. Mm, you, there was a little transference of like creativities at around age thirteen, where I stopped drawing. I used to draw a lot, and then when I became a teenager, there was a big change which was my moving to the United States from Ecuador. So there was the language change, right? The cultural change. And in a way there was an art change. So I, my personality is, I did a personality test a few months ago. Uh, you know, I, I fall into like 90s, 93, 94% creativity or perhaps even higher. So like that means that I'm always looking for something to do, something to create, right? Uh, so at first it was drawing, painting, and I still have it. Uh, it's part of me. But at, at some point in my teenage years, 13, 14, I discovered language, English, and I had to learn it. And I think that was a very, like a shock to the system. So I had to express myself in a different way, and I, st and I started writing poetry. Now, uh, I think most writers start with poetry. Right, it's a very it it it's adolescence of poetry go hand in hand, uh, I think, and so I sort of went through my teenage years in a in a frenzy of poetry, I want to say, right, like just writing and reading a lot of poetry until 
until I graduated high school and I kept writing poetry and that's where my first book of poems comes from. But, you know, after that I started writing prose, essays, and here I am. So that, that's how I developed as a writer. Now it didn't really come to fruition until much later in terms of like my first book being published when I was around 29 or 30 years old. So it was a good, I want to say from the time I graduated high school, 10, 12 years of reading and writing a lot of things that didn't get published. And then I guess I came into my own in my late twenties. Thanks to Graydon Miller who published my first book. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, stumbling into um, the world of publishing and and you know um, choosing between self publishing the option of self publishing and also um, looking for a publisher I think that can be uh, a daunting process. Mm -hmm. um, but but how did all that go for you? Well, I found the process of getting published difficult because. I didn't want to spend any time sending manuscripts out. I wanted to spend whatever time, little time I had writing, you know, uh, making little movies, writing my own scripts, just creating, right? So it wasn't easy for me. I felt like it was a waste of time to write a, a letter saying, hey, are you looking for what, for writers? You know, um, waste. I felt like it was a waste of energy. It was a waste of time. Uh, and plus, the, the the new technologies have opened up ways so that new publishers could, could come about and publish you. And I happened to be lucky that I knew this uh, friend named Graydon Miller who had just started his own venture of publishing uh, his, his friend. And he published his own work. And he published a couple other writers, including some work by Ernest Hemingway that he found um, sort of like it, it wasn't under copyright, so he published it too. So I can say that at my first publisher, Graydon Miller, who owns Grady Miller Books, had also published Ernest Hemingway and his friend Roberto Villa. So I'm in very good company. After that, he's published other people and I've helped him. But it's a it's been a very small venture, but I think getting that little help was amazing for me because Self-publishing is a venture where you have to do everything yourself. But when you have a hand, and when somebody takes an interest in you, uh, it makes things much easier. So I want to say that mm, it, it was the best of both worlds for me. It was very small, right? So I didn't have to like send out manuscripts or you know feel like I was spending a lot of time doing things that I didn't want to do. But I did. I didn't do it myself. There was somebody who did it for me, like a team. You know, like a publisher, somebody looked at the grammar, somebody who looked at the um, cover, and so on, and and that frees you incredibly. Right. Um, I have to say that for many um, first-time authors, um, stumbling into um, the option, even the option of uh, getting a traditional publisher, is is not. It's, it's never easy, and that is the reason why a lot of people uh, will fall back, you know, to the um, self-publishing options. And I think in this case, you are really, um, re really lucky to have found um, the publisher, and you know that's how. And I think uh, it's a wonderful thing to, you know, keep that cooperation going for your subsequent books, uh, like you say, to you know. Um, you have been uh, working with the same publisher to publish all your um, other books, all right? So, uh, Patricio, uh, tell us about um, your first book and where you got the ideas from. I mean, you know, when we're talking about fiction, um, uh, most of the time it's all about the imaginations that we have in our head, and you know, it's a little bit of reality and imagination. Um, and that's how you um, deliver the whole thing, right? Um, as, a, as, a, as a book at the end of the day. So tell us about how this, this idea came about to you. So uh, the, the novel that came out just recently, right? 
Okay, so the uh, Reggaeton Cruise is a work of fiction, but any sort of um, any parallel with the real world is not unintentional. So it's there because we live in this world, right? And we live in a world that is so close to being a, a fictional sort of a carnival or a nightmare in some situations, right? And I think the, the, the whole novel, Reggaeton Cruise, so it's a cruise, right? It, it stems from that kind of idea that the world, the modern world is at the same time incredibly fun and incredibly entertaining, like a like a cruise that you take and you go and you enjoy and you have your your water slides and you have your screens and you you know some cruises have like helicopters and it's just like a Disneyland, right? On water, but at the same time, and that's the the thing about the modern world, the contemporary world. It's like we are one step away from catastrophe in some cases, right? So. So you, we have the world of terrorism. We have the world of, uh, uh, well, you know, pandemics. We have the world of, uh, uh, you know, financial crisis, identity theft. You know, a lot of negative things that go hand in hand with the world of entertainment. And I think that's where that's the center of the novel. You know, a world that is our world, which is all entertainment and all kind of light and shiny and all of these but it's also kind of like a very dangerous world with global warming and, and you know different ideologies and whatnot but at the same time it's a fun world and i don't want to get away from that kind of parallel that that you know it's stimulating but also it could be a disaster mm -hmm. right so what's interesting is that um right now when we we are living in right so um you wrote this is this a project that you wrote during the pandemic say that again is this a project that you wrote during the pandemic yeah exactly yeah i wrote it during the pandemic and this is my first novel i mean i'd written something else but this is the first one that comes out that came out <sighs> maybe it's a way for me to like filter everything that i saw in, in a fictional way but, it, but if you think about it, our world is so interconnected and you get like the most weird stories and the most sort of unlike, unlikely people interacting, right? Through say, uh, like a screen um, or like YouTube or whatever. So that's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Things like viral fame. I mean, think about that. It's such a weird thing. Like somebody's not famous and they might post a video that's you know like homemade and suddenly they're mm -hmm. full famous worldwide you know and it's it's mm -hmm. so it's sort of fascinating to me how that happens viral fame uh the entertainment society that we live in you know like we're always looking for like the next sort of uh fix you know in terms of entertainment or mm -hmm. uh tourism all these things and for the novel i wanted to put it all together in a net in the net that was a reflection mm -hmm. of our times. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, so here we have the, uh, I'm actually sharing the uh, screen Thanks. for your uh, book, for the book. And uh, this is the cover, and this is a little bit of the blurb over here. And uh, so this is, where I want to ask you about the multi-dimensional or probably multicultural uh, characters coming from you know different parts of the world, yeah. and um, uh, tell us about that. I mean, I, I'm 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 intrigued about the fact that you know during the pandemic when we are all disconnect, somewhat disconnected, mm -hmm. and uh, you know um, writing about things on globalization and even uh, people from different parts of the world coming together. Um, now, for, at this point of time, you know, uh, I feel that it is a dream. It's a dream for all of us to go back to that world, the world that we, we've been used to, right? right so right. 
tell us a little bit about the characters. Sure. And where you got the ideas from? Yeah. So uh, the characters are from all over the world, but they inhabit the world that you and I live in. Except that world, maybe it's shown in its true dimension of the globalized reality and the hyper reality. Okay, I'll, I'll go into the hyper reality in a minute. But so, like the thing that think of think of it this way: we all live in a in a, in a flat kind of system where you can have somebody from Japan. So three of the characters are from Japan. Okay. Mm -hmm. They live in California and they're uh, sort of learning English in California. That's very normal, happens all the time. People go from different countries to learn English in England and California, New York, wherever, right? So that's one one kind of migrant. What kind of migrants are the people who go to study English abroad? Well, they have money to go and, and live somewhere for a year or two years, right? Mm -hmm. And they might go back or they might, you know, um, experience the country wherever they go in this case the United States right then you have different kind of migrants or people who leave right so you one of the other characters one of the main characters is a a boy essentially a boy a 16 year old boy from Ecuador where I'm from he's from the mountains mm -hmm. the Andes okay so he decide his father dies and and so the thing about globalization is that globalization is not uniform so it touches everybody right so we're all globalized uh, but at the same time, we're not living the same reality. So somebody who lives in the United States is globalized. And somebody who lives in Liberia, uh, West Africa is globalized, but they're not globalized in every way in the same way. So, but they do encounter each other. So one of the characters, the one from Ecuador, the 16 year old boy migrates after his father's di father dies and he uh, is sort of um, left, left to take care of his family. He decides, you know what, I'm going to go to the uh, core meaning the first world. Okay, so he takes that trip that very perilous trip through the through Central America through Mexico through the Rio Grande and he finally arrives at the United States Okay, and so we see him taking that trip and that is part of the his road towards the heart of the globalized world right uh, the United States from a place that is also global, but not as connected right so that's another one of the characters the three Japanese sisters. Then there's a, a boy from from uh, Estonia. Okay, he's part of the European Union, a, a small developed country, uh, but he happens to be very good at video games. Not so many teenagers are playing video games nowadays, right? He's so in, immersed in video games that he lives in that reality, like. He's a boy, he's like 13, 14, and he like he doesn't play soccer well. He like soccer is very popular in Estonia, right? He's not a good player, he's kind of chubby. Kids make fun of him, they pick at him, on him and all kinds of things. Well, he enters the online world and he finds a new persona. He becomes a, a, a killer video game player. He's like the number one video game player for war video games, right? For this particular video game uh, that, that, that he's good at. And that calls the attention of uh, the US Army and they decide to give him a scholarship to come study here in the United States where they need a lot of good video game players to operate drones. You know, like drones are flown by the army. Uh, and so a lot of the flyers are actually very young people who are good at video games and some of them don't know the difference. Anyway, one of the characters is from Estonia, okay? The other one from Ecuador, the three sisters. And uh, then there's another one from Liberia. Who, who was a part of who was in Africa during the Liberian Civil War and he was adopted by an American um, investor and so he moves to the United States and he lives here okay then there's a tennis player also from Ecuador and so he, he's a he's a former tennis player and he's moved he's trying to find out his kind of what to do with his life after the the tennis uh, career, his tennis career is over um, there's a there's a, 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 a a migrant from El Salvador who takes over her mom's business in a, in a small town in El Salvador, which is um, in Central America. And so she makes the trip to the United States, but doesn't make it. Okay. So you throw all of these characters in during a period of seven years, and they interact in a way that they all touch each other in ways that they don't know, they don't understand. Some of them are comedic. You know, the novel sounds really serious, but also there's like moments of deep comedy in it because they don't understand each other. 
at all, but they're also very human, okay? And they influence each other across time through the net and through the physical world. Uh, and that's pretty much the, the heart of the book. And then the plot happens, uh, mostly the heart of the novel takes place at the reggaeton cruise, where all the different strands of all the different characters meet during a very momentous event of, I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I was like, you know, um, pretty much engrossed with, um, you know, your explanation, you know. <laughs> That, that was that was really good. Yeah, there's a lot, there's and, a lot of things going on. So just telling telling it to you is sort of uh, it's it's even but it but it coalesces in the in the book. You know what I mean? That's nice. So I, I wanted to ask you. I mean, like you know, when you actually said um, uh, students are uh, coming from different parts of the world to learn English, right? And you being um, a teacher yourself, right? So, um, is that is that where you got the ideas from? Like, you know, especially talking about students and your you being a teacher, and you know, a little bit of your personal experiences. Yeah. You know, I don't know who said this. It might have been Freud, or maybe it's just like a meme. But somebody said that we're all when you dream, when you have a dream, you're all the characters that appear in your dreams. And I think in terms of books, it works the same way. The writer, because we're dreaming up stories, right? We dream up stories. So the writer is all of his characters or her characters. So in a way, I think I'm all of them. Uh, so all my experiences are connected to all of the characters you know, in ways that uh, are very sort of tangible and real. Like I learned English, right? Uh, I've worked at English schools, so like I'm very familiar with that process. Um, and then I've met people from Liberia, for example. A good friend of mine is from there. Um, I've, I've, I am from Ecuador. I'm, fam I'm familiar with the, with the sort of migrant experience. Um, so yes, it's very, very real, very, uh, very personal but at the same time it's all sort of imagined or exaggerated or diminished and made to fit the story you know what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah because a lot of times um fiction books have more truth uh than non-fiction books you know because i, I think it's easier to incorporate a lot of things uh in, in the world that we are living in right now, you know, uh, and put it in, in a fiction form. Uh, I think it's easier to just to write and to um, express ourselves. So what are the other aspects of the book that, you know, that um, you've gotten inspiration from uh, things that are happening in our world or probably from other characters that you've met in real life? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. I just remember something that I, I wanted to say before, which is that um, there's something that I wanted to write at the beginning of the book that I ended up not writing, but it might be at the beginning of the next book, which is that this is a work of fiction. Any similarities to any real person in, are absolutely intentional. You know, so it's a work of fiction, but any similarities are absolutely intentional, meaning that it's not real but it's completely real and so i guess that's what i what i want to say okay and that's what i want to touch upon mm. also how we all come from different places right like so you have the character or of delphine right delphine is the one of the main characters not the main character of the book the young um indigenous or uh native uh guy from the andes region from the mountainous region who decides to migrate he was inspired and i want to underline the word inspired because it's not completely him but it's inspired by a real boy a real man who posted a video on youtube okay 
a real sort of uh, uh, countryside boy, right? He posted a video on YouTube. There was a song in which the Twin Towers appeared. Okay, and now the Twin Towers is a really serious matter, but he posted a, a sort of dance song about the, the Twin Towers and the, in a way that was really odd and cringy and it became viral overnight, okay? So this guy became viral overnight, and he ended up uh, traveling South America. I don't know if he came to North America, uh, singing, singing and performing. He became a, like a famous performer. So I took that story and incorporated it into my book, where you have a main character that's not him, but that's inspired on him, um, that that posts a, a, a song that becomes that goes viral. And why are we so interested in viral stars? Like, what is it about uh, certain things that really call our attention? And I think it's that line between between something that is ridiculous, okay, and wonderful at the same time. And I think that's the theme of the book. At the same time, it's like something that is ridiculous and wonderful, dangerous and fun at the same time. It's like these times are very not not one way or another, you know. So. Um, yeah, that's that's like you see a question there. Mm -hmm. So, we actually have a question from Graydon Miller. Uh, thank you for uh, um, joining us and thank you for asking the question. Who is your favorite character? Um, so, yeah, to please you. Uh, my favorite character in the book. Um, I want to say that my favorite character is Sandrita. She mm -hmm. is uh, the immigrant who doesn't make it to the United States mm -hmm. and who tries her best to migrate and she just can't make it. Mm -hmm. she, it thinks circumstances, she can't mm -hmm. cross the river, She there's a, something that happens uh, and then she has to return home, okay? And she mm -hmm. returns home and the character, she becomes very bitter very kind of angry right and she's angry for years and years until at some point she realizes that maybe she didn't make it to the united states but there was somebody who was with her that made it to the united states mm -hmm. from the south right and then upon seeing this boy who is delphine i don't want to give the whole book away upon seeing this boy who had traveled with her and who seemed so unassuming Right, who seemed so unassuming and so kind of, he was nothing to her, but he makes it to the United States, and on top of that, he achieves notoriety. Uh, he becomes famous. Okay, mm -hmm. she has a moment when she views all of this, and it's not like she learns about it little by little. You know, she learns about it at once through the power of the internet. And she has a moment where it's like I could go on hating this guy and thinking that he's nothing. Or I could turn around my whole life so that I can admire somebody that I used to despise before. And that moment is very interesting for me because when you change your mind about something, oftentimes you end up changing your mind about many things. So those deep moments of, of change are so interesting to me. And interestingly enough, this character of Sandrita, she changes her mind about the, the guy who, Delphine, who she used to despise or never never mind, right? And she decides to become a fan. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that she changes that and that changes her whole outlook on life. But it doesn't change her personality. Like her personality, she's a very strong woman and very kind of, well, she was bitter, but then she becomes the opposite of bitter in a way. Um, like mm -hmm. which is wonderfully alive so she's a very complex character who uh who i really really uh in, enjoyed writing and she was absolutely made up in the sense that she's not based upon anybody and i think uh i love that because she's just a creation you know thanks for the question mm -hmm. uh -huh. right Thank you, thank you, Mila, for um, asking that question. Now, um, I actually have been um, sharing a little bit of uh, 
the um, glowing reviews that you've gotten for uh, the book and uh, a lot of a lot of um, um, great reviews over here um, and uh, uh, tell us about the feedback that you have gotten so far um, especially I can see over here you know he's get um, I mean one of the um, comments over here or one of the reviews over here saying his characters give me hope and respect for the future of this hot, hot multi-ethnic world. <laughs> right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about um, the reviews that you have gotten, uh, feedback from your I mean, family. Sometimes, family. Yeah. Um, they they yeah. point at the uh, complexities that I'm not even aware of, or they, you know, they point out things that are uh, really nice, or they come from a different perspective, you know? The there was a review of somebody who pointed out that the that what they they liked was the sort of um, how all the different stories of all these different characters take off in a way that are also like parallel and influence each other. Um, mm -hmm. So that that was a really nice compliment. Uh, and but there's also other kinds of comments like somebody said I've never read a book that was like uh, more than so and so pages and I read a longish book and it's not even that long it's like 200 pages mm -hmm. 200, right so somebody coming at it from like that perspective of like uh, you know what it caught my attention and I was able to read the whole thing and now I'm interested in reading long other novels probably much better novels like they read the classics Okay, that's. I would rather have you read the classics than my book, but if you have a little time, you can read my book. But if my book influences a reader to say, like, you know what, I'm going to pick up Dostoevsky, or I'm going to pick up, uh, you know, like Ernest Hemingway, or I'm going to pick up uh, whatever uh, classical literature, Shakespeare, you know, then that's awesome. Because uh, literature, just the same way that we're all connected in the globalized world, literature is also connected you know in we influence each other we're influenced by our uh books that we read as young people or at the same time and enter that world you know so when people say your book was an inspiration for me to start reading more i'm like okay that's i did it you know mm -hmm. right um and uh talking about um reviews and talking about your um upcoming books like you know do you have a plan to come up with a sequel for um the reggaeton twos or you know any other projects that you're working on right now i mean so i'm i'm done with the reggaeton cruise and i decided to take a, a willing break because i had other ideas but i needed to take a, like a breather you know and to do the promotions which is great that you're uh interviewing me and you know thank you for that because it's it's great to be asked these questions and then you get to think about it live and, and answer them mm -hmm. but i think i'm coming to the point where i'm thinking about uh the next project you know so there's going to be an audiobook for reggaeton cruise most likely mm -hmm. so we're working on that we, i think we have a reader we've picked a voice to be and you know it's very important to have the right voice read the book so we've done an audition and, and I really liked one of the readers. Um, so that's going to be the next project. Okay. And then uh, I've thought about, you know, uh, a comic based on it. Okay. But we'll see about that. But these are projects that I'm not going to be doing creatively. It's just going to be other people possibly doing. It. And then I have a novel, you know, the other novel that I have that's going to come out next year. Uh, that's already written. So in terms of a new writing project, I haven't started anything new. I'm still just uh, enjoying my my post reggaeton cruise, uh, you know, aftermath. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is definitely uh, a pleasant kind of an uh, aftermath, I guess. You know, um, definitely looking from the reviews that you've gotten and. Um, so you you still have books that you have not published or it's, it's, it's in the process of publication, right? So tell us a little bit about that. I believe it's the same publisher is going to be publishing it. As yeah, well. so this is uh, Too Much Sweetie. It's the next novel. And I'm a very uh, sort of obsessive uh, 
person when it comes down to corrections. So you can see there's a lot of corrections there. So we're, I'm working on that right now, like, you know, change this word for that word or, you know, making it flow. And this one is longer and, and it's going to be more, it's more ambitious in a way. Uh, so this is the next one. It's not, this is the proof copy. Uh, look for it the next year. But I don't even want to take any attention away from the reggaeton cruise because uh, the reg it's all about the reggaeton cruise right now. And Too Much Sweetie is next. Uh, if those of you who read Spanish, okay, since we're in promotion mode, those of you who are, read Spanish, this is 80 miles per hour. Uh, poems in Spanish, 50 poems in Spanish, uh, very poetic language. I I still, you know, love my Spanish uh, language and I want to keep working on it. Uh, hopefully the next book will be written in Spanish. And then I have the 20 essays uh, called Walking Around with Fantin Bukowski, which are 20 essays about art, politics, uh, sex, and cultural displacement. So that's, this is our essays, like, like critical essays. So for those of you, I've written a little bit of everything, just kind of curious about the world, you know? Uh, but I'm gonna be spending some time uh, thinking about the next project, uh, which is gonna be a short novella. I wanna write a short novella in Spanish. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about your uh, um, Spanish uh, poetry, right? Um, do you ever, like, you know, uh, have you ever written any poems in, in uh, English? Uh, well, you know, I have written poems in English, um, but I think in terms of poetry, I'm more drawn to Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and for English, I have worked as an editor for other poets. Uh, my good friend, mm -hmm. Aldo Tambellini, uh, we, together with Graydon Miller, my publisher, we published his collected poems. And that was a great project mm -hmm. that we did. Uh, and I think that's where my poetic kind of sensibility in English came out. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, whenever I go to poetry, it just goes back to my kind of childhood sense of language, you know, those rhythms that I can't really replicate in English are still there in Spanish. And uh, it goes back to the full idea of the interconnected world, right? Um, you, you move forward in the world of, of English and the, and the kind of global culture, but many of us in, the, in these cosmopolitan sort of um, cities, we retain our original uh, senses of language and rhythm and culture and all of that. And in that I have Spanish. And, and that's something that I don't let go of and I make a very kind of conscientious effort to keep it alive in the poetry. So I, I can say very clearly that I'm a Spanish poet and an English prose writer. Mm -hmm. you know, so I've made that kind of division, but sometimes I cross over. Mm -hmm. That, that's really um, pretty much um, uh, an in-depth explanation about um, what you write and who you are as a writer or as a poet, you know. Um, so um, last but not least, uh, what do you have to tell your uh, audience out there you know, or, or the readers out there who are watching this, who will be watching this later on? Um, you know, I'll be putting this up on YouTube and Instagram as well. So what do you have to um, say to your um, fans or even your, your family members for the support that you have given so far? Yeah, uh, what I'd like to tell them is that to turn things around, okay, and what do I mean by that? That for every little story that you hear, whether it be in the media or a family member telling you the story, or maybe uh, you read a book or something, there's always like another story, like the side B. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, in my literature, I'd like to bring out the B side and bring it out into the open and that to look for that because I think that's where, that's where it's going. That's where it's going. The, there was a, I'll leave you with a quote, or with the paraphrasing, it's not gonna be an exact quote. So I think Omar Said, who's a great writer of um, renown and who's passed away, he said that the 20th, 19th and 20th century, and I'm just loosely paraphrasing, okay, were times when the 
uh, sort of Western civilization met civilizations from other parts of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be through like travel and colonization, uh, all these different phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. So it was about Western and uh, Southern people meeting each other. But he said that the 21st century was going to be about uh, people from the non-Western world, whether it be Latin America or Africa or uh, uh, Asia, meeting each other face to face. So I think that's where that's the B side. That's the other story, right? We're, we're talk a lot about migration, immigration, all those things. And oh yeah, the migrants are coming into London, the migrants are coming into America, all these things, right? But also the B side, it's like the immigrants are meeting themselves, you know, without any, without any kind of walls. And that creates, that's fun in a way. So that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right, so um, Patricio, um, I have totally enjoyed, you know, speaking to you and, uh, you know, learning a little bit about, you know, where you got the ideas from and your uh, very thoughtful uh, answers to my questions. Um, thank you so much. And uh, also thank you, um, Graydon Miller, for um, joining us for, a, for a, a short period of time and also for asking us uh, the question. And I hope that, you know, later on, uh, more people will be uh, watching this. Uh, thank you so much, Patricio, and uh, also for your upcoming projects. Uh, I wish you all the best, and uh, probably we will meet again, you know, for um, subsequent uh, interview series to talk more about your uh, latest projects when we out. Um, it's a pleasure talking to you. I have enjoyed, and I, I like very so much for joining me. I very much like you have a very elegant way of uh, presenting the project, and I really enjoy that. I wanted to say that uh, I've enjoyed truly your your way of interviewing. So we'll definitely meet again. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Patricia, for uh, joining uh, us for the interview today. And uh, hopefully, you know, um, people will uh, pick the book up, and uh, you know, you can check the book out on uh, Amazon and uh, I would- and For I those who've already read it, sir, to interrupt, for those who've already read it, leave the reviews, they make a huge difference. Now you saw today, even just like a three word review, uh, that'll make a difference. So that's, I, I wanted to interject that right there. Exactly, exactly. I mean, definitely I would say um, a review is uh, what um, motivates writers to do to uh, write more, right? I, I guess so. Um, it also actually lets us know where our weaknesses are, where our strengths are. So I think uh, it's always a, it, it's always great to actually get feedback from um, the readers and uh, in, in the form of reviews. So um, you've got you've gotten like a, a total of twelve uh, reviews over here, and uh, I would also like to um uh strength over here that you know uh it's available both in the kindle and also paperback format on amazon and um it's available for page purchase and uh thank you so much um patricio for joining me today and uh, hopefully we will be able to meet again in, in future thank you so much and have a, a wonderful week um ahead as well take thank care you. all right take thank care you. Right. Thank you.